All right. Uh, thank you, Yasin, for uh, clarifying some questions that uh, I had, and maybe, um, yeah, will be useful for my talk. So my talk is about what you can do when all you have are logits. Uh, and I have a closed a close source in my title, which may irritate some people, but I promise you this is important for both open and closed source models. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be here with so many of you who are leading these open source uh, movements towards generative AI, especially language models. However, we cannot have this conversation without talking about closed uh, source models. Uh, they naturally have a huge competitive advantage. Uh, you know, because they have access to data, compute, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they tend to be performing uh, very well on the standard benchmarks. And we had a great conversation about evaluation. But this competitive advantage that they have uh, uh, necessarily means that uh, they have gone to great extents to remain <coughs> closed. Uh, so even keeping things like the uh, hidden uh, size uh, um, uh, you know, uh, hidden, right? Uh, so uh, I will talk about, well, Yasin talked about how open are open source assets. I will talk about how closed really are these closed source models or proprietary LLMs. Um, so it turns out that um, this, is, this is recent work that uh, uh, we came up with. Turns out that you can learn a lot about these closed source models uh, just from uh, the logits. Uh, so uh, just as a reminder of what these logits look like, are uh, these are the scores that are assigned to different tokens in the vocabulary uh, when you're conditioning on some context and you put these logits into a softmax uh, uh, operation to get your probabilities. So these logits uh, hold a lot of clues. Um, we deal with log space, uh, but for the purposes uh, of this talk, that's not very uh, relevant, but a lot can be learned from these logics. And so uh, why is this the case? Uh, so it turns out that when you uh, build these large language models, all you're doing is uh, projecting uh, your outputs from a hidden dimension D, uh, which is what this um, uh, hidden state vector uh, H represents to the logit space, which is um, a matrix in V by D. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and that, again, goes into your probability. Uh, you put everything through a softmax. So uh, basically, you have uh, these uh, v-dimensional logit and uh, probability uh, uh, um, representations, uh, which turns out occupies, like uh, the, the outputs occupy this d-dimensional subspace in these larger uh, v-dimensional reals or you know, uh, probability simplexes, respectively. And so uh, what, uh, what this results in is that your final layer is very low rank because uh, uh, your size of the vocabulary V is much, much larger than D. So this is a known result. This has been around since 2018. Uh, this results in what is called a softmax bottleneck, which is a property that most language models have, uh, all the large language models surely have. Uh, and so as a direct consequence of this, uh, if we come up with a collection of D linearly independent outputs from your language model, these are these probability vectors, uh, uh, you will form uh, a basis for the model's image, uh, which is kind of unique. So, uh, and what we did in our work is that we made targeted queries into these closed APIs to extract uh, something like D um, uh, output vectors, and that helped us extract the model's hidden dimension and uh, related information. Okay, so how did we go about doing this? Uh, perhaps not super, uh, uh, you know, uh, important when everything is open, but um, as somebody said, uh, I guess it was Ludwig who said that everything will be closed in a couple of years. So I think this is still important. How do we recover these kinds of model logics from APIs? So we assume that we'll have access to top K log probabilities, even if it is, if K is one, we can still make it work. Uh, and we have access to something else called logit bias, which is a common API option where um, uh, the API allows you to bias certain tokens 
um, uh, to, um, you know, uh, most likely this allows certain tokens in the generation and so on. So using these two things, we uh, do some simple math, move things around in the probability space, and we can recover uh, the logits um, while preserving some degree of uh, numerical stability in about V over K minus one API calls, uh, which costs around $500 for a model like GPT 3.5 Turbo. Um, not, not possible every time that a new model comes out, but we'll talk about what you can do once you know uh, what this uh, hidden size is. Uh, but if the hidden size is known to you, then you can uh, do everything in about D API calls, which is much, much lesser than, um, uh, um, uh, you know, if you had to make the uh, vocabulary amount of API calls. In general, you need to do something greater than, slightly greater than D, so order of D calls. Okay, so uh, what do we get out of uh, this? Uh, one key result is that you can recover the hidden dimensionality of the model. Uh, so we'll uh, collect uh, these output probability vectors one at a time uh, until uh, the number of linearly independent outputs in the collection stops increasing. Uh, and so uh, if, if we sort everything by the singular value and we see where the singular value starts decreasing, that corresponds to the dimensionality. Uh, so it turns out for Pythia models, we were able to exactly recover the dimensionality, but more interestingly, we were able to discover this for GPT 3.5, uh, which has hidden dimension of about 4,096, which corresponds to something like a seven billion <coughs> parameter model, uh, which was very cool. Uh, so uh, again, uh, if if this is uh, this is starting to look like just a closed model question, uh, actually, uh, I uh, think what we can get out of this is something called a model signature, which comes out of you know uh, the things that I said about you know the image of the model, um, and the key thing here is that model signatures are unique. So you can identify language model outputs just by model signatures. So different checkpoints even correspond to these different model signatures. So it is possible to precisely determine which checkpoint a model output came from. Uh, and we are able to do this for, you know, like a case for uh, the uh, Pythia models, but it is true also this would hold for, um, you know, these uh, closed source models. Do you have the training set units in this plot? Sorry? What are the units for the training set axis in that plot that was just on the screen? Because Oh, uh, so two. these are checkpoints? Yes. Yeah. Um, what, 1. 1.2 is not a training set number. So is this like... So this is times, times 10 raised to Oh, five. sorry, I yeah. couldn't see that yeah. number. Lewis's hair. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so other applications involve, you know, detecting these model updates, etc., uh, which uh, uh, in the morning Graham and Tatsu were complaining about, you know, like they didn't realize when OpenAI updated the model. So potentially this is possible, not exactly uh, directly from what we have now, but we're working on methods in which we can detect if this model went through some kind of RLHF, et cetera. Uh, we can do things like finding on our maxable tokens, LLM inversion, which, uh, you know, Venting and Sasha and co uh, colleagues have worked on uh, figuring out these hidden prompts. And uh, to a certain extent, we can even recover the parameter matrix up to a certain rotation, et cetera. So, uh, so what? Okay, this is great. Uh, some low-level details. What's the what's the big message here? So, if you are a language model provider, uh, you might want to mitigate the risks of an attack. Um, you could remove the API access, um, but you can, you know, still still figure something out as long as you're using like a, a very large vocabulary, very small hidden. Uh, size, uh, you can remove access to language model probabilities that will annoy a lot of your users. Everyone likes to look at confidences uh, and you could uh, switch to something like character models, which um, you know uh, requires a lot of engineering. You throw away a lot of the things that you learned already. Uh, so not ideal, uh, but more interestingly, what uh, uh, we want is this is a step towards model accountability. So uh, releasing something like a model signature 
uh, will uh, help build trust between uh, you know, API users and providers. Uh, it will help us implement efficient protocols for model auditing. And it will finally uh, help us verify the language model identity and ownership. So um, uh, just one last note, this is a simultaneous discovery. Our paper came out the same week as this Google paper came out on exactly the same uh, idea. Uh, the only uh, thing is that we were able to talk about the size of uh, open AI models. They weren't some, uh, you know, legal uh, drama here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, so this is uh, this is my student Matt, who did most of the work, and uh, also collaborator uh, Sean, who's also at USC. Thank you. <laughs>